Creativity is the core of great science. I'm Paul Nurse and I'm president of Rockefeller University. The training and also the way of actually carrying out the, um, the, um, the, the profession is quite different between a scientist and a doctor. Understandably so, that's not a criticism of either side, it's just how it is. So then we mix two sorts of people like this together in the same activity and we expect them to work together. It's like mixing somebody who only speaks English with French and assuming it's going to work. It won't. So what do we do about that? What we have to do about that is first of all recognise the problem and analyse it. And then secondly, we have to deal with it. We have to get the two individuals, types of individuals, to understand their differences, to see where they're coming from, to realise why they have differing views, and how they can perhaps work best together. Do you think any of us in the biomedical profession take the slightest bit of notice of trying to do that? All smacks of sociology and stuff like that. We don't. But this is something where we really need to think in the future. Have I applied it successfully in, um, in my own work? My own work has tended not to involve directly medicine, so I've not been exposed with my own research in that way. But I have seen it many, many times in my colleagues, and because I've led uh, research institutions, and I've done my best to, um, at the very least, um, get mutual respect on both sides of that divide. But I actually think we need a much more professional approach to that problem, and I would say it's key for greater success in this area. I think prevention is really important. Um, it's, it's often not given the airtime it should um, by the scientists themselves because it's quite a difficult um, subject to study and often requires very long-term trials, sometimes over decades, with large numbers of individuals before you can get good statistical results. So it, it does, sort of doesn't fit in well with a normal scientific career. If you've got a PhD of four years, say, knowing that you're participating in a study that takes 20 years to, to carry out, it just doesn't fit. So it's quite difficult to actually uh, do good work in some, um, in some cases in this sort of area. Um, it's also a very complicated issue. Um, we all know of individuals who have smoked 40 cigarettes a day who live till 90. Um, but of course we happen to know that if you do smoke 40 cigarettes a day, on average in the population, um, your life expectancy can be um, reduced 15 or 20 years, I forget exactly the number. So it's a hugely negative impact upon your health, even though certain individuals may actually survive that. So understanding the interaction between um, the impact of um, environment with, um, with genetics, I think is, is really crucial in getting good preventative advice out there. Um, but this makes it, these epidemiological studies, that's population-based studies as they're called, even more difficult because you're not only then trying to simply control for whether an individual is exposed to a particular environmental um, impact such as the sun or tobacco or whatever, which is difficult enough in itself, but you're also saying we need to subdivide the population up according to their genetic makeup to get good results and we may not even quite know how to divide them up and what, which um, particular variants of genes are important. So these are difficult problems, um, but we are beginning to get into the territory where we can perhaps address them. And maybe that will help us put to rest a lot of the quackery that can go round um, advice about prevention. And uh, I would really like to see that because there is so much nonsense that is published out there um, uh, the media like it because it's relatively easy to understand and it's a bit of a care, you know, scare story. Um, but if we, if we ask questions like, is butter good for you or bad for you? I mean, I can never remember because what was the last thing I, I read about it? And usually the reasons um, that we as the public get confused about such matters um, are that the effects that are reported are actually pretty small. Um, and it all depends on the context of the trial, let alone the genetic makeup of the individuals involved in it. And we get blown around like a weather vane um, by just the latest report, which is often um, made to be rather sensational. So I, I see this being rather slowly developed because the, the, the studies have to be so long term and we're not yet in a, a good uh, place for 
um, looking at the interactions between genetics and environment well. But I think it's really important because if we can give good advice to individuals um, about what their lifestyle is, then that's going to have a big impact. I think measuring outcomes, particularly in cancer, is actually crucial because um, if you make incorrect assumptions in the way you're doing analysis, um, things can go bad rather quickly actually because you, you get statistics that show that certain cancers or certain diseases are dramatically increasing um, when it may be only that we're diagnosing them better and, um, and then everything goes wrong in trying to think about it. So um, uh, what I think about this issue is uh, it's a, essentially a public health issue is that by having better diagnosis and I've talked a little bit about how you can use um, molecular tools to get better diagnosis, um, which I think will classify a disease better. By using more modern techniques and applying them in sensible ways, I believe that uh, we are likely to uh, get better information upon which public health statistics can be, um, can be acquired. And I do think it's important because that public health information is going to be important for the population-based studies that are necessary um, to understand prevention better, genetic effects and, and environmental effects. And uh, if we have imprecise information there, we're going to get deeply um, misled. And once again, we'll give rise to quackery because uh, people will read that um, uh, maybe uh, um, uh, allergies have increased tenfold or, or something. And, the, and then they say, well, this is due to pollution or whatever, because it's the way people think when in fact it may have nothing to do with that and we get campaigns in favour of certain approaches which are simply totally misplaced. Uh, 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 one example which was really close to a tragedy was the, the so-called triple jab um, for immunisation of young children against several diseases. Um, there was a, um, very, very flawed research which suggested that giving the, um, uh, the, the three uh, vaccines together would cause autism. And th this was uh, barely taken seriously by the um, clinical community because um, it was, uh, the, the data was really um, not uh, very good. But because it got such public support, this changed the way in which, in, in, in fact, immunizations were being carried out and then led to a rise of the very diseases that you're actually trying to eliminate. And I think that's a consequence of not reporting properly the data that you have. Um, because it, autism was seen to be on the rise um, in particular circumstances when in fact um, it, it was simply being diagnosed better and it, it appeared at a certain time in life when um, these inoculations were given. So accurate information um, about disease and disease onset I think is, a, is crucial for, uh, for good uh, prevention and good healthcare delivery. This will be a strange answer, but it's arrogance that we think we know what to do. Um, we have a number, I think you were probably, this question was aimed at what particular disease and so on. There's a variety of diseases out there which are of um, significance to global health, um, the, the in, infectious disease, but also in um, more westernized nations, um, issues to do cancer and obesity, heart disease and the like. But I think the biggest challenge is arrogance. We still do not know enough about these diseases and we still do not know how to deliver care in the most effective way. And even though there is quite a lot of money sometimes aimed with, uh, with very um, uh, benevolent um, uh, intentions, you know, we think of institutions um, such as NIH investing in uh, um, diseases in the developing world, of Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust and the like. But often we do not know enough about the disease or how to deliver it in our own more advanced societies, let alone in underdeveloped communities in Africa. So we, I think we have to accept that we don't know the answers and put more input into how we deliver that than simply we thinking we can um, go to Tanzania and, and put a hundred million dollars there and solve the problem because often it just ends up um, simply not dealing with the problems. So I think it's arrogance. 
at all levels, both in not understanding the nature of the disease and thinking all the basic research has been done, it has not. It's thinking that we now know how to treat it in particular ways, often high-tech ways, but perhaps not the most effective ways we should deal, um, get better treatments. We still don't know that. And then trying to apply it in countries where there isn't um, 24 hours electricity every day, so you can't refrigerate samples and so on, means you have to take a completely different approach to how you deliver um, medicines and health care. So arrogance is my number one um, uh, bogey in this. That's what we have to get rid of. Mm -hmm.